played in a band called Pop Will Eat Itself in the mid 80s, early 90s, and we became this kind of punky pop four piece. We got very influenced by hip hop and dance music, which basically led us to the sampler. That delving into the electronic side of things with samplers and synths really kind of paved the way for what I would do when I did Pi and Requiem for a Dream. In 1996, I'd been playing in my band for 10 years and we'd come to a crossroads really. I think we were just burnt out. I moved to New York in, um, to sort of see what would become of me. To some degree, wherever I went, I had no job and no money, so, you know, it was whatever, really, just give it a go, you know. My girlfriend at the time worked in PR for electronic bands, and um, she knew a guy called Eric Watson. He was developing this script, and they were trying to make a film, and they were hoping to have electronic music in it, and she just said, you know, oh, you should speak to Clint. He likes films, he makes music. And um, Eric... And this other guy came over to the house, and it was Eric Watson and Darren Aronofsky. They had a script they were trying to make. No industry was interested in them, and it was really going to be an independent, you know, hand-to-mouth sort of operation. And Darren told me about the film, and he, he talked to me about elements of Pi. I'd never scored a film before, but I had experience of how to make some music, you know, which basically stood me in my stead. I wrote some music on spec from the script and that kind of went well and we, over the next couple of years really, we ended up making Pi. We had no industry around us to say you can't do this, you can't do that. It was just a case of us doing what we liked and what we thought was right and what we believed in and what felt good. I think that was a pretty powerful approach because you can't find a unique voice, you just got to look inside yourself really because nobody can be more, you more than you, you know. Then Pi came out and it won at Sundance and Darren got the chance to make another film and, and he asked me if I would like to score it. And the film was Requiem for a Dream. <sighs> Requiem for a Dream was actually a much more difficult proposition than Pi had been, for me anyway. I think films are always difficult, but Pi, we seemed to sort of hit the groove pretty early and Requiem, we didn't hit it for a while, you know, and that was, you know, I guess that's the, the reality of making films. It, you know, you've got to dig in and find it sometimes. Darren wanted the film to be hip hop oriented because that was the music he could have grown up with and the film set in Brooklyn and he wanted it to sort of underpin, I guess, his experience of growing up there. I remember um, Darren sent me a piece in the film where Alan Burstyn's character first takes the amphetamines and she's cleaning the apartment and he had used She Watched Channel Zero by Public Enemy as a score under it. And it was absolutely amazing, it was so good. But the problem with it was they didn't really say anything other than like, ooh, we put two bits of things together and they're cool. It didn't have any real depth to it, you know. I'd sent Darren a CD of ideas that maybe had 20 little snippets of different things. Those ideas had been written from the script, from the book, from talking to Darren, from, from just getting a vibe, you know, and, and also as well, things that I was listening to, things that I was excited about, elements I wanted to sort of bring to it. We're just basically taking these pieces and trying them against the film and see what it said to us. We gradually worked through bit by bit and we weren't really getting anywhere. And Darren would try music in other places, move it around and pull it apart. Mostly they said nothing. But we got to this one piece of music and we put it against the scene where Marion has slept with a therapist and she's leaving his apartment. And the piece that we used was the piece that would become Lux Eterni. It was just like, I mean, I, it's ridiculous, really, but I still get chills thinking about it now. It was so, it just worked, you know, and I'd never seen anything like it, how a piece of music can transform everything. You've got music and you've got images, but you put them together and now you've got a, a third undefined element. This is what I say about listening to the film. The film will tell you what it wants and that sound design of the thunderstorm, all that sort of stuff with the music creates somewhere where the fear of what this is building to takes over, you know. Once we got that, we went, oh my God, what, you know, we've stumbled onto something here. I mean, and from there, we, we, we knew we had something that 
was perhaps very different to what maybe we even thought we were going to get, you know. And that changed the whole way of thinking. Forty says you're coming up quick, kid. Thanks, man. He says you're smart, you're loyal, and you're not a junkie. When I was trying to find the film, find my role within it, Darren one day described it as a monster movie, and that every time the addiction won, that was the monster winning. Him saying it was a monster movie suddenly made it very relatable to me. I watched all sorts of movies, you know, growing up in England, stuff like, like John Carpenter, Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween, David Lynch's early stuff. So Lux Turner becomes the monster's theme, and we can drop that when something bad happens. Oh, shit, you got a white driver. <laughs> when Marlon's character's in the car, and they all get shot, and then the music coming off the back of it... Now we're starting to get this structure in the film. Something I've discovered then is that when you get a piece of music that does work for the film, your view of the film becomes very different in as much as even if you've tried a hundred other things before that and none of them worked, once you've got something that does work, now you can look back at those pieces and go like, ha, huh, that didn't work because such and such, but if I do whatever to them, they, they can actually become part of it now because you see them through a different light. You can sort of go, OK, well, this piece of tension music, once I put it under Marion deciding whether she's going to make a call or something like that, you can just feel it. It comes alive, you know. Experiencing what the film is bringing to you, at least for me, it's my guide into the film. hip-hop montage, the work that Brian Emmerich did on the sound design. I think it's as integral as, as, as the score is because it, it, in places it, it does what the score is doing, you know, that responding to the needle, to the eyeball. We were sort of bouncing off each other to make that work, you know, sometimes I'd have the lead, sometimes Brian would have the lead. So you got this build of elements that were, were hopefully in sync with one another that, that gave you a very, very interesting palette as we went through the film. I you know something. Mm. I always thought you were the most beautiful girl I ever seen. Yeah. Goes. Well that piece, it's a very emotional piece, and it is a romance theme, if you like. This was also on that CD, very early piece, but it didn't have context until we had other things. The first version, Ghosts of Things to Come, it's still a good place where they're dreaming and they're hoping, you know, but we know they're also getting themselves into a potentially bad situation. So you need to sort of set up the pain that they're going to experience. It, it became about that juxtaposition of sweetness and a, a sadness, the melancholy. What was I supposed to do? I'm going to sit around and watch you push off and knock on myself? Just don't put it all on me, OK? You need to care about the characters, be invested in them, and it's, I guess, part of the drama of pulling you into the story. Getting the money is not the problem, Harry. What is the problem, for Christ's sake? I don't know what I'm going to have to do to get it. They were both really great in that film, and if you're dealing with good performances, it's kind of easy to join in, you know, because you're not fighting anything. You can, you can, you can go like, this idea works, but, ooh, we could now do a little bit more because the idea works. But also, when somebody is doing it, when they've embodied that role, your job becomes ten times easier because you don't really have to do too much. Uh, You'll get strung out, for Christ's sake. Oh, come on. I almost fit in my red dress, the one I wore to your high school graduation, when your father liked so much. Oh, I remember how he looked at me in that red dress. Ellen Burstyn's performance, it, it's all there. She doesn't really need me. So my work, then, can become different. I can almost zip the dress, the red dress. I've almost got oh, the zero. Because I'm keeping out of the way, she's doing it, and I can either just tick along or stay out, or the sound design can do it. 
And again, you know, as I say, you're, you're open and you're listening to the film and what it's bringing to you, you know, and where you don't need to intrude. Mrs. Goldfarb, we've tried uh, several medications and you don't seem to be responding. I believe we might be at a point where we might want to try some alternative methods. At the end of the film, if we didn't get this bit, the whole thing was going to fall apart. Darren said to me, Requiem is a musical term, so we basically listened to a lot of Requiems. But what I did then was I, would, I sampled varying chords or hits. No real musical passages, just moments, if you like. Different chords and sounds and whatever, and I laid them out on the keyboard in the sampler. It was just completely random. It was just hi-hat patterns was playing stuff, uh, drum beat, you know, kicks. Uh, and I just recorded it all in and just looked for bits that I liked. So you might get the... Ja -ja 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 -ja. That was just a... Ja at one point. And now it's come off the kick drum or something. It's going... Ja -ja 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 -ja. And I like that bit, so I cut that. Then there was something else, then I cut that bit. And then I started putting together the bits that I liked. And I sent it to Darren and, uh, and, and Jay, who was editing it. And I think, I, I think I wonder what the hell I was up to, to be honest, but it was all overdriven and too hot, you know? But we stuck with it. I remember me and Darren sat down and, and he drew a graph of the last 20 minutes of the film of where it should go up. Come down where it should come down here, go back up there and peak here. So I go, okay, I could then go back and arrange what I had through that map, if you like. You go, okay, well, this is a quiet bit, so I'll put that there. So we start off with a lighter version of this piece of music, but it gets darker. You can cut then from that brutality back to Harry calling Marion on the phone. I'm really sorry, Marion. I know. And even though it's now in a melancholy place, that brutality is still with you because of the cutting backwards and forwards with the images and the music. And you just start off with a very rough piece of work and, you know, I'd send it to Darren, he'd go like, yeah, it's moving on, but it's this bit doesn't quite work here and try this, try that. It's a very collaborative thing, which evolved into the meltdown section at the end of the film, leading into Lux Eterna. It's all right. Don't worry, you're in a hospital. Uh, yeah. Who's that? She'll be sent for. She'll come. <laughs> we didn't want Lux Eterna just to be sort of nihilistic. And whilst there isn't a lot of redemption in it, there's an emotional swell to it. There's definitely a twinge of hope in it. I don't know how or where it comes from, to be honest. It became part of the piece as we were doing it. Maybe it's just the emotion of the music pulls you through because there's a lot of numbness about their world, you know? Heroin and that type of thing. So the music being as stated and as powerful it is perhaps pulls you back to feeling there is a crackle of light. Once we'd sort of got these elements working and it was sort of set up like a quartet. Darren said, we should get the Kronos Quartet to play it. Well, the Kronos Quartet are probably the world's premier quartet, I would say. They've probably been going like 40 years. Darren had seen them play, and he thought, well, they're the best in the world. Let's get go for the best in the world. If they say no, we'll go for the second best in the world, you know? And thankfully, they loved the idea. Kronos really took it and interpreted it way beyond what I could have imagined and done to be honest. It was all written. We'd got it all in place. It would have just been demo strings and, you know, the, the samples that I was using alongside it, the rhythm stuff. So I'd done all these crazy things with samples and stuff like that, and Kronos just did it with, they just went, oh, you mean like this? And they could make their instruments do it, and in a way do it better because it was real. I love sampling and all that sort of stuff, but 
they created their own language with it, if you like, that, that I think really worked better. They undoubtedly put their personality, their experience, what, that, what it said to them, and took it on another level. I remember me and Darren, we, and we, we recorded at Skywalker, you know, like George Lucas's place, it's just unreal, you know. And I remember him and I looking at each other one, we, we, Kronos were recording this music, and we go, this is incredible that they, 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 that they have interpreted what I've done in such a magical way. There's no two ways about it. That film changed my life. I say it changed my life because I realised then that, like I said, you have the image, you have the music, and you put them together, you have this third element that's almost nothing to do with you, but it's almost magical, you know? And I found it very difficult to just go back to almost what felt like a two-dimensional thing of just making music, you know? I craved that bouncing off the image. And if I'd not gambled, I would never have met Darren. He would have made that film, probably. It would have been a different film without me. It might have been a better film for all we know, but it wouldn't have been what it was. It was just happenstance and magic that makes that happen, you know, and I kind of I dig that. <laughs>